Yes, it's me again. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I'm your host, Liv. She who has learned so, so, so much during this run of Atlantis episodes. I've honestly been so blown away by what I've learned, both in research and in speaking with these archaeologists. I'm willing to bet most of you have learned a few things along the way, too. I mean, honestly, who knew Atlantis wasn't even a myth, let alone all the other wild and often troubling things floating just below the surface. (sighs) Get it? Anyway, bad jokes aside, this is the last episode of my series of conversations with archaeologists about Atlantis, the real archaeology of the Mediterranean, pseudo-archaeology, and even conspiracy. There is truly, deeply, so much to say about the thing that the story of Atlantis has become. I mean, honestly, what would Plato have to say about the way his philosophical allegory has shifted into... Well, what exactly it's become is best explained in this very episode. I spoke with archaeologist Steph Holmhofer about Atlantis, but not really the Atlantis of Plato. Instead, Steph gives us a rundown on what Atlantis has become and how it got there. Steph is not only an archaeologist, but an archaeologist studying pseudo-archaeology and conspiracy. Straight up cult style groups, and even the alt right. It blew my mind just learning this was a field of study, let alone its connections with Atlantis, and even an unrelated group that Steph studies that is from my own home island. But more on that later. This episode was so incredibly fun to record and to edit and thus learn it all over again. Steph and I had so much fun chatting, not least because we're both from BC, and like I said, she studies a group that was on Vancouver Island, where I live and where I grew up. I can't wait for y'all to hear this episode. Conspiracy, conspirituality, pseudo-archaeology, we dive into it all, and then some. Conversations, The Conspiracy and Conspirituality of Atlantis with Steph Holmhofer. In theory, we're talking about Atlantis, but also kind of everything that stems from Atlantis and the idea of those kind of dangerous conspiracy theories. Right. Yes. Oh boy. Atlantis. It, <laughs> it, I have these sort of like two sayings where I'm like, it's always Atlantis. Um, one of them is it's always Atlantis because so many conspiracy theories tie in these elements of Atlantis or conspiracy theory shows or, or just anything with the M word mysterious always draws mm. in Atlantis. So I'm like, Oh, it's always Atlantis. Um, but then the other thing I always say is it's always Blavatsky, uh, Helena Blavatsky. And so Helena Blavatsky is, is one of the reasons Atlantis is so popular today. Um, she was an occultist in the 19th century, started the theosophy society or theosophy movement. And, I mean, Atlantis can be traced back to her popularizing it, helping to popularize it, but also so many other conspiracy theories also draw from Blavatsky or or movements, religious mo- or uh, spiritual movements and, and con-spiritual movements. It's, it is always Blavatsky. I will go digging through these ideologies and I will always find Blavatsky in there. Interesting. Okay, so that just made me realize that I should probably also ask you to tell my listeners a bit about like why I'm talking to you. So what are you studying? You're 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 doing your PhD in this right now. Is that right? Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm doing so my please. PhD. 
Great. And in your Canadian, I want to say too, which is very exciting. Or are you Canadian? Or are you just studying in Canada? I am Canadian. Yes, <laughs> I am <right>. Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> I rarely get to talk to Canadians. So it's an extra thrill on my part. <laughs> so silly. You know, what's funny is like, I have the same thought when it comes to like certain subjects that I'm interested in. I'm like, you know, I don't often get to talk to Canadians. But when I started diving into um, extremism research and, and getting to know the extremism experts, there are a lot from Canada, some really wonderful Canadian experts. So that was very exciting for me. That is good. We do love other Canadians, right? Like, yeah. I have so many problems with this country, but I'm still like, oh, you're Canadian? Oh, that's cool. <laughs> or like, they're Canadian. Right. Great. Right. It's yeah. true. It's our thing. I mean, it's like just bred into you. Right. Do yeah. you remember the uh, you remember the Tim Hortons commercial where it was like this couple was traveling and they had their like Tim Hortons travel mug and everywhere they went, they're like, oh, hey, I'm from Calgary. I'm from Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. We love to it's do like that. A, yeah. yeah. I've made it my thing on the podcast, certainly when I'm having conversations with people like anytime like an actor is mentioned like I find it's my obligation to point out if they're Canadian and yeah. I'll just like make make a point of, like even interrupt just like really quietly they're Canadian like it's, <laughs> it's necessary <laughs> so, it, it comes from my mother who always says it comes from my grandmother so it's a yeah. long standing <laughs> thing yeah that's awesome uh yeah so yeah so you're studying like please tell me yeah tell me what you're studying <laughs> It's, it's so weird that sometimes it's hard to like summarize, right? Yeah. Um, I saw, honestly, one of the best recent um, descriptions was yesterday. I saw, I'm just pulling it up right now. There mm. was a, a tweet from somebody who was kind of just joking around, but they said, um, they were joking around about the, the Q and, one of the big QAnon conferences. That's not a QAnon conference. Uh, definitely not a QAnon conference. And so there was this person who had, who had mentioned that, um, memetic warfare so memes mm. are very popular within the, the alt-right and there's been this sort of meme warfare actually going on for for a time now and this person was like oh memetic warfare has been going on for forever and then this other person just retweeted that and said i picture archaeologists dusting off a faded pe peppy mean they just dug up on the battlefield marveling at the number of spelling errors it contains and i was like oh yeah that's that's my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, yeah, my PhD is uh, in archaeology. I've been an archaeologist for a number of years before I, I went back to school. Um, and I am studying what's called conspirituality. So ideologies that are built from blending new age spirituality with conspiracy theories. Ooh. And so I study how archaeology and pseudo archaeology in particular are sort of embraced within conspirituality used to justify and support and build these beliefs in contemporary North America, but also historic North America as well. And so there's a particular conspiritual movement that I'm studying uh, from the 1920s and 30s that had a settlement on Vancouver Island, uh, Vancouver Island, De Courcy Island and Valdez Island. They had three settlements spread across these three islands this is so local for me i'm thrilled <laughs> yep I, I figured you would probably know <laughs> so yeah i study this this movement um called the aquarian foundation they were called the aquarian foundation they were led by a man who uh, called himself brother 12 he claimed i mean he didn't give himself the name he said it was the um ascended masters that gave him the name brother 12 that is the blavatsky connection so yeah, he had the settlement and they were really into theosophy. He was also really into other conspiracy theories and they kind of, he blended theosophy and, and these conspiracy theories and that's sort of what the Aquarium Foundation was built off of. But they draw, there are a lot of parallels between this group in the 1920s and movements like QAnon today, which are nearly 100 years apart, but they're still into kind of the same things, the same basic conspiracy theories are, are uh, prevalent in both and they're still very popular today as they were in the 1920s so that is kind of what I do that's fascinating where on the island uh just south of Nanaimo okay yeah, just you can tell I'm from here because I realize I literally just say the island and then I assume everyone knows what I'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah it's true if you're from BC and, and somebody says the island even though there are so many islands there are so many we know islands. exactly which island you're referring yes. to so yeah 
Well, Cedar by the Sea is where Brother 12 and the Aquarian Foundation built their first headquarters. When they first came to Canada, he was British um, and he came to Canada. Well, he had actually lived in, in Canada for a number of years, um, moved back to Britain um, or Europe, I should say, had this encounter with the Ascended Masters in 1924, who told him he was going to be the 12th brother of the Great White Brotherhood. And then in 19, he sort of published a bunch of stuff, gained some popularity. And then in 1927 is when he came back to Canada. He believed that humanity was transitioning into, I guess, kind of two different things. So one transition was we were moving into the age of Aquarius. Hence, he named his group the Aquarian Foundation. Uh, but also, he believed that there's so much like context and backstory here. The Blavatsky thing is basically she argued for seven root races, that there were seven root races that um, were sort of basically just different time periods in human evolution. And each root race uh, had seven sub races as well. Oh, my God. Right. So we start off with the, the Polarians. They are a very ethereal race um, of people. They just kind of were these little blobs. The Polarians evolved into the Hyperboreans. The Hyperboreans evolved into the Lemurians. Lemurians evolved into the Atlanteans. And the Atlanteans evolved into the fifth and the greatest of all the root races, the Aryans. Oof. Right. Big oof. Big oof. And then... The, the sixth and seventh sub race or root races hadn't yet come to happen. They were kind of going to happen in the future. Um, Brother 12 believed that he was going to begin the transition of humanity into the sixth sub race of the fifth root race, which was apparently very important. So, and all of this was going to happen in British Columbia um, on these islands. So he took his, his disciples with him. They collected more because they landed, um, they landed in Toronto first, um, sure. right? Obviously, <laughs> it's Toronto. Um, they landed there. He gave a bunch of talks to some of the local theosophy societies um, because he was really, really into theosophy, even though he had kind of separated himself from the theosophical, official theosophical society, um, which is also other backstory. But he so he gave these talks and he collected a bunch of a bunch more disciples and followers from the Theosophical Societies. I think either the Toronto chapter or the Ottawa chapter of the Theosophical Society had to fully shut down because everyone left to Whoa. join Brother 12. And he did this and he moved his way across West, collecting um, very wealthy followers until they got to Cedar by the Sea and they bought the first of the three properties they ultimately would own where the transition into the sixth sub race would begin. That is wild. The way I did not expect that this call was going to end up with my <laughs> island, like where not only I still live, but I fully grew up here. Like, it's so weird. Oh my gosh, that's so interesting. And I can't believe I didn't know that. I went through a whole period where I was really obsessed with cults and everything. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been recently talking to somebody about, do you know, uh, this is like, I mean, it's still equally, I would say, conspiracy, but very religious. But do you know the book Michelle Remembers about Victoria? It's like about uh, yeah, this Yeah, I know girl the name. Who, yeah, it's about, it's like basically started the satanic panic. The idea this right. woman like remembers that she was a child, like basically sacrificed to Satan in Victoria and turns out like, right. oh, they think Victoria is like this extremely satanic place. Anyway. Um, so I'll just say, I, I like researched all that when I was young and I can't believe I didn't come across this like local <laughs> wildness. Right? That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, so I'd love to hear then how this, I mean, I, I want to make sure we're talking about, I mean, definitely like, I think it's inherent how problematic stuff like this is, but I want to make sure that that is a big focus of this. But when it comes to the idea of these, uh, you know, the Atlanteans in mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. So I'm fascinated because you also said Hyperboreans, which is, mm -hmm. I'm not as familiar, but is a term from Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but the, so where does the Atlanteans come in? Because in theory, they're like some of the most ancient, but they were really far down on your list. Do right. you know kind the, of how that works? Root race. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, to learn how that works, yeah, we'd have to read the, um, the secret doctrine in particular. So Ooh. Blavatsky um, wrote... A couple of, of um, these occult cosmologies, Isis Unveiled, she wrote in, 
I want to say, no, 1875 is when she started the Theosophical Society. It was 1870. She wrote Ice is Unveiled. Mm. Then a few years later, she wrote The Secret Doctrine. And these were, she claimed this was knowledge that had been found in these um, secret texts, the the Daz, Daz, Dizen. There's a D and there's a Z in there. <laughs> I'd have to remind myself. Um, so in The Secret Doctrine in particular, um, she goes into a lot of detail about each of these sort of root races and the history behind all of them, the history of the planets. Um, and it's like millions and millions and millions and millions of years of history. Um, and each, each root race also evolved from a particular sub race of the previous root race as well. Yeah. Wow. It's very, very complicated. I find her and these two cosmologies, the secret doctrine in particular became, um, kind of the, the doctrines of the theosophical society. So she'd mm -hmm. already started co um, founded the Theosophical Society by the time she wrote The Secret Doctrine. Um, but they really adopted all of these cosmologies. And they're really difficult to read, to be honest. I, I have copies of both and, and I've gone through them and I, it just, it's so complex and difficult yeah. to tease out what she's sort of saying and how she um, talks about the actual evolution. So to be honest, I'm not, I'm not really sure uh, why no. Atlantis ended up kind of middle of the list um mm -hmm. it it just sort of fits in with her idea of these evolutions and life cycles and and whatnot so i'm sure the complexity is part of it too right it's just that like the more complex the more confusing and ridiculous to read like the more likely it is that people are going to believe that she's really got all this knowledge because like oh how could it be so detailed and complex a cosmology if it wasn't true so yeah i can imagine yeah. it's just so troublingly Intense. exactly right and and she got this knowledge from these secret texts that nobody has ever seen Ooh. um right and for also from these ascended masters um who also have all this like intense knowledge and they are they're not like physical beings they are these ethereal beings on this other plane that she could communicate to and how how do you doubt that right like especially at that time how do you doubt something like that just you can't see it, but doesn't mean that this person isn't communicating with them. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And she was also quite inspired by Ignatius Donnelly and his version of Atlantis mm -hmm. as well. So it's a time of the, it was a time where people were so curious about where did we come from as people? Um, and she and Ignatius Donnelly and so many others were kind of just trying to fill in these blanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say he's the other one that I think between the two of them, that's we can probably trace all of the current Atlantis, everything to those two people, both of whom came, you know, a couple thousand years after Plato wrote about that yeah. <laughs> nonsensical thing that he was not trying to say was history and he did not believe and he was not telling a myth and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> you know. <laughs> an allegory Plato wrote yeah. an allegory and, and then suddenly 2000 or so years later these people are coming up with these yeah. wild stories of of how real it was and then how you know I think Ignatius Donnelly I have not read I have it but I've not yeah. read through that <laughs> yet I don't want to say yet I probably yeah. won't read the whole thing at least um but you know I think his was more about uh, proving it existed and then it seems this Blavatsky was more about the spirituality section that then people yeah. seem to have taken hold of yeah yeah Ignatius Donnelly in the Atlantis the Antediluvian world he he kind of was like okay look guys I haven't found Atlantis but it was real and these are my 13 points to prove it was real we just need to find the proof for that so his kind of I, I always think of the antediluvian world is almost like a, a call for help. Um, mm. uh, one of those, okay, I'm, I'm giving you all this information now, historians and archaeologists and, and linguistics folks, like, you go find me that proof. Um, that's, the, that's the way I've sort of always thought about mm -hmm. the antediluvian world. So, and it's just, yeah, it's interesting to listen to people talk about Atlantis today when they talk about these Atlantis theories. And everybody mentions Plato. And they're like, well, Plato first mentioned Atlantis. And I'm like, yes, he did. But you're telling me Ignatius Donnelly's Atlantis. You're not telling me Plato's Atlantis. Plato didn't actually even write that much about Atlantis. No. It was like a few odds and ends mentions here, but not really that much. That's the thing. And it was so, like, 
it, you can tell by the way people talk about it that they want to call back to Plato because then you've got this ancient Greek source, right? Yeah. You have to have this ancient Greek name in order to to make it sound legitimate. But they clearly, or if they have read Plato, they're not paying attention to Plato or they don't know what he was writing. And like, I don't study the philosophers, you know, like I did my degree and I somehow managed to like never read any philosophy in an entire classics degree. And I'm fine with that. But even I know. Bravo. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> mythology, right? Um, and, but I think, I mean, even I know enough about Plato to know that he's not a mythographer. He's not trying to tell mythology. He has no interest in that side of it. Not to say he doesn't have an interest in mythology because it was part of their world. They didn't consider it mythology. They considered it part of their world. So he certainly cared. He certainly like mentioned gods and things, but he wasn't telling a story from myth. He was making an allegory to prove an unrelated point about hubris. And, and it's so interesting to me the way people reference Plato, but then don't reference what he actually said, because in order to believe Atlantis from Plato, you have to believe that Athens was equally advanced in that time period, which is historically and archaeologically untrue. Right. And nobody ever mentions this incredibly advanced Athens that's like it doesn't matter because it's not lost and it's provably untrue and so it's like no 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 in my theories of Atlantis there's no Athens I don't know what you're talking about it's fascinating and and I think it's so telling about the things the way that these conspiracy theories pick what they want and ignore the rest and I think that's basically pseudo-archaeology too right yeah, yeah, exactly. Pseudo-archaeology is, is just a type of conspiracy theory, an archaeological conspiracy theory is the way I've been defining it. Um, and it is, yeah, it's very much just cherry-picking, cherry-picking yeah. what suits the narrative. And it's not to say that the information that's being used is is incorrect at times. Like if people are pulling from archaeological sources, historical sources, they're using information, but they're divorcing it from its context and they're leaving out certain bits and pieces And I guess counting on their audience to not go looking for that. And then, of course, the other idea, too, is that this idea of suppression and and circular reasoning and and where if you're trying to argue like, no, that that's not true. Like there's here's the evidence to help us say that's that's not likely not how it happened. That is taken to to mean it is true because Mm -hmm. we're now trying to suppress that Mm -hmm. information or reject that information, stigmatize it. And then of course, if they do find something that does support them, that also means it's true. So it's yeah, conspiracy theories are uh, difficult to deal with because of that fact. Mm -hmm. Um, They can be tricky. Because the real conspiracy, they say, would then be everyone hiding the truth. Yes. You know, it's everyone's teamed up. All the historians and archaeologists have teamed up to talk about how Atlantis isn't real because they're hiding the real Atlantis. What would be the point of that is always my question. It's how I felt about all the COVID conspiracies. It's like, why would the whole world team up to pretend that there was a (laughs) pandemic? And also, talk to me about how you think the US and Russia and China are going to come together and plan this. Because... Historically, I think this is unlikely. Anyway, I'm getting into my own, but like, I think, and I think that that sort of is inherently, you know, the nature of of the way certain people think is like, there's a government conspiracy for everything. It's true. It's true. Conspiracy theories are actually just really easy to fall into. Um, And then you get the idea, also the idea of of community um, uh, being part of this group of like-minded individuals and Mm. and who are supporting you. And um, when you find that sense of community, it's like cults right people join cults to to find community this community of like-minded individuals once they find that but that's so hard to break people out of that right so um yeah it's it's funny conspiracy theories are they are a lot easier to fall into than what you think and just i've had conversations where recently i had a conversation for example where this woman was telling me um no i don't believe in any conspiracy theories and immediately launched into a particularly aggressive conspiracy theory in this conversation i was like oh there it is there's the conspiracy theory um but the the issue that then like sort of we were just talking uh, about is how do we address that without feeding into that idea of Mm -hmm. suppression and stigmatization and that's that's the struggles how do we address Mm -hmm. these issues confront these issues 
without being suppressive. Um, mm-hmm. It's hard. Mm-hmm. Do you have any like strategic ways that you try to go about it or are you just sort of constantly learning? <laughs> <laughs> constantly learning. I, yeah, it's tough. Um, I'm working on finding ways to address and discuss conspiracy theories without amplifying them. That for mm. me, is kind of the first step because I think it is important to talk about these and I think it is important to highlight these ideas that are being shared and these, these um, ideologies and these beliefs when they're built from archaeological knowledge, when they're built from our information. Um, I think it's really important to address that and, and talk about that, um, but have to find a way to do that without amplifying the message. And especially when we're dealing with the alt-right um, and social media is a great, wonderful tool to have these discussions on. And especially because we see examples of this everywhere, it's also a really easy tool to amplify these messages. Mm-hmm. So that's where I'm kind of at right now is trying to find the best ways to talk about without adding oxygen to it and driving attention and followers and elevating that. Another thing that I find sort of helps is when I talk about the the historiography essentially of these ideas the the development of these ideas so when I talk to somebody about Atlantis and they say well you know Atlantis might be real um, I like to talk about how Atlantis went from um, fiction to fact essentially Mm -hmm. and and I trace this path and I find sometimes that that helps people sort of take an extra breath and they it doesn't escalate in more um, in at least in the experiences I've had it doesn't always escalated as much as just outright being like no you're wrong mm-hmm. there are always exceptions to that rule of um, course. <laughs> oh man Atlantis has some fierce fanboys um that I've tangled with a few times but yeah I'm I- currently deciding how I'm how best to release these and how much to put myself out there with them I'm like right right yeah it, I- it's <laughs> tough it's really tough and yeah um especially oh man there's this one guy who likes to email me um just these these epic emails in defense of atlantis and he got particularly riled up by all the discussions that led to this podcast interview mm-hmm. you, you clearly remember those discussions that were happening i Twitter, i do right? and i appreciate how cryptic you're being about them <laughs> yes <laughs> So these discussions happened on Twitter and this man got even angrier about it um, and was harping at me on Twitter and sending more, more and more emails. Mm -hmm. And it's especially, it impacts women, uh, marginalized genders far more than it impacts men. Um, So that's also something we have to consider when we're trying to discuss these is, yeah, like you were just saying, how much can we discuss that's not going to, or that's also going to minimize potential harm to ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, there, there's so many different things to think about um, when discussing these. And that's something that I also want to be part of my PhD is trying to come up with the best way to discuss these and address these without amplifying and trying not to feed into that stigmatized mindset either. So Mm -hmm. right now, still learning, um, still practicing different things, but Maybe one day we'll have a good idea. Yeah. I mean, just the way you were saying about tracing the the historiography of it, that's sort of what I, and I haven't, I haven't written at the, the time of this recording, I have not written the, the episode or episodes that will accompany them. Um, and so I intend to, to have these narrative episodes that basically just track what happened because I do think my t- go to and you know it tends to be i don't i don't really dive in on twitter because i have sort of learned my lesson there yeah. um but i i just kind of go straight to the plato didn't believe it was real and let me tell you about that kind of right i think that's it's one of the simplest and it's certainly you know unless people are really deep like if people just have a basic idea of it that they think is real they're going to second guess everything by just hearing that like yeah. no no Plato, that wasn't even what Plato was doing. He he didn't seem yeah. to believe it at all. If you read it, it's it's definitely an allegory. It might even be tongue in cheek. Like there's so much you can read into the very the only ancient sources we have for Atlantis. That's the the yeah. clear the clear point to make too is it is the only ancient source <laughs> that <Yeah>. mentions Atlantis. <laughs> there is yeah. not a single other. And yeah. thus, like that, you know, there's 
there's so many things that should make it obvious and then it's yeah. interesting when it's it doesn't make it obvious to yeah. people yeah atlantis from what plato wrote of atlantis mm -hmm. atlantis sounds like an amazing place like mm -hmm. what a cool place to be <laughs> with all these like gold dolphin statues and these like rings of land and these huge amphitheaters and structures and all these things like what a cool place and enormous too i i think he described it as larger than asia and libya combined and of course mm -hmm. this is based on on what the greeks knew of those land masses and how they had mapped it at that time so so not necessarily asia and libya as we know it today but the general idea still exists that Atlantis was enormous. Mm -hmm. So why was Plato the only one talking about it? Where <laughs> exactly. were the people traveling to Atlantis? Where, the, where are the people trading and living there and moving in and out? Because we know that the Greeks were, were record keepers. They loved mm -hmm. to write shit down. Um, yeah, it, even if it's right? just like a linear B reference to, because yeah. of course this is Bronze Age. And you know, the, the whole thing then is, well, it was so many thousand years before, blah, blah, blah. But even still, like, you know, the likelihood is that we would have a linear B reference to like, well, we gave them some wine or we yeah. gave some wine to some people who were just past those ruins of Atlantis, you know, yeah. like there there certainly would be something, you yeah. know, Herodotus would have heard about it. And even he made up a lot of history at times, but he also did travel around and talk to a lot of people. Yeah. And, you know, Herodotus would have heard about it at the very least in, you know, all of his, his talk. And yeah, they, that's the thing, you know, they're, there would be at least one other reference, but there would certainly be lots of references. Were yeah. it true or, or were there some kind of, um, you know, epic event that caused the fall of Atlantis? Yeah. And then of course the ultimate thing is, well, where is this super advanced Athens <laughs> then? Because yeah. we have all the archeology span of Athens and like bronze age Athens was pretty meh comparatively to other bronze age sites <laughs> in the area right like yeah. it, you know i think yeah it's best described as meh it wasn't not there but right yeah it wasn't one of the big ones no not at all um and you know we're always we're always learning more obviously we're always uncovering more we're always learning more um part of archaeology is being flexible and, and accepting new ideas and we're always accused i'm always told oh you're closed-minded archaeologists are closed-minded no we we are extremely open-minded that's how our um knowledge shifts and we learn more and we um, adjust our, our thoughts as they come about most of us mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um so yeah i mean you could argue sure maybe there's the possibility that one day all this information will be uncovered but what like i would expect to it have been uncovered by now mm -hmm. so many people have gone looking and again thinking of the size the the materials that they had i, yeah. I honestly would expect we would have found it by now mm -hmm. to be honest well also plato is quite clear about where it is right he's like pillars yeah. of heracles right yeah. so he's basically saying it's at the strait of gibraltar yeah. So if we, you know, it, it, people then will argue it's like somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And I'm like, okay, but he says very clearly, <laughs> yeah. Pillars of Heracles, which is the Strait of Gibraltar. Yeah. You know, so yeah, it, it's, that's the thing, right? He, he, yeah. he's not being cryptic about it because it's an allegory, because he's not presenting something that he believes as real and that he is presenting as fact. Now, one thing I really want to make sure that we talk about with you, because I think you're probably my best source for it, um, is how harmful mm -hmm. these things can be, mm -hmm. um, specifically, and I know base level amounts of this, but but the way that it's then used to justify um, white supremacy. Yes, right. So again, if we think about um, Blavatsky, we can start with Blavatsky. It's always Blavatsky. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so Blavatsky talked about how um, the Aryans, which were the, the best of the best of the root races, um, evolved from Atlantis. And um, Germany went through this really intense period of, of re-enchantment, trying to, to find their history, trying to find their stories, um, leading 
up to World War One, World War Two. Um, it didn't. The stuff didn't just start in World War Two. It started a long, long, long time before that. And um, some of the the influential thinkers um, who were part of this reenchantment that ultimately um, the Nazis ended up attaching themselves to this line of thinking, they were really enthralled by Blavatsky's idea of Aryans and Atlantis. And they combined that with many other sources um, to essentially create this idea of these Aryans as being like almost supernatural beings, these incredible beings with just like super white skin and blue eyes and super, super powerful. And so during World War II, the Nazis, they had the, what was called the Ananerbe, the um, SS Ananerbe. It was like their archaeology and heritage division. Mm. And they mm. were very interested in finding proof of the Aryans, kind of the Ignatius Donnelly approach to Atlantis. They were interested for the Aryans. So looking for this archaeological proof of Aryan homelands and centers and all this stuff. Um, but part of that involved also looking for Atlantis because they were looking for their homeland, essentially. So they're looking for the Aryans, but where did the Aryans come from? So they were looking for Atlantis. Um, and so, yeah, that was that was a bigger part of the war. It wasn't like an enormous part of the war, but it was a bigger part of World War II and, and Nazi ideologies and beliefs than many people realize. Um, mm -hmm. And so since then, you have um, Atlantis, at least from what, I've been looking at Atlantis traveling into from the original Nazis right into neo-Nazism as well. Um, and this, I through this idea of Aryan. So there are um, a lot of, and I, again, I'm just focusing on North America, not mm -hmm. necessarily European groups, but in North American groups, um, you have a lot of, a lot of neo-Nazi movements um, or, or individuals, high level individuals who have spoken about Atlantis and talked about this history and um, because of its connections to Aryan You've got leaders. There was one man who was a leader of some major American neo-Nazi parties in the 60s and 70s who now writes books, book after book after book about Atlantis um, and Atlantis in North America. North America, he rewrites North American history to suit these ideologies. You have other folks today who his most recent book actually was published just this last July. You have other folks who write for some um, big time white nationalist websites and they also talk about Aryans and Atlantis and they pull in, they even actually pull in ancient aliens. Um, I've mm. seen one guy talk about the show Ancient Aliens and he just argues, well, no, 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 they're not, they're mistaken when they're describing aliens. They haven't found proof of aliens. They found proof of these Aryans and they just need to recognize that. There was a, another neo-Nazi group in... 70s, I have to find it again, who um, had Atlantis in their name. There's mm -hmm. other neo-Nazi groups who write these very long um, manifestos uh, talking about the history of, there's one in particular I'm thinking of who has this very, very long manifesto describing the, the history of Aryanism, and they also draw in Atlantis. So it's, yeah, it's just through these, like, it's almost like the telephone game. You start off with this one idea, Blavatsky, and then as it gets passed on, it changes and it changes and it changes um, into what a lot of white nationalists and, and neo-Nazis are using today. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, even just simply and from my non-research in it, it seems like the easiest way to counter the idea that everyone came from Africa is to say that no, there's a subset that came from Atlantis. We just don't have it. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's true. And I think that's also why so many people, um, a lot of these sort of groups latch on to archaeological knowledge. And because it's this idea of Atlantis is very intangible. Um, archaeology provides tangible. It provides these things you can hold, you can go see, you can travel through these rooms, um, at these sites. So it gives something tangible to the intangible. So I see a lot of um, groups and individuals trying really hard to pull in archaeology and tie it to things like Aryan and Atlantis or just these other white uh, European ancestors, thinking about the slew train hypothesis in particular, um, just to find, to, to be able to say, look, here is this tangible item that proves this all true, um, even though it doesn't. And again, the, like what we were talking about earlier, it's that divorce from context and filling in these blanks with their own uh, narratives. Mm -hmm. It's extra fascinating too, because I mean, 
if you think about it, if you just let yourself kind of believe that, sure, actually, the one time, you know, Plato was actually secretly telling us this history, even though, you know, he didn't actually do that. Yeah. Um, you know, even if so, that it you have to still connect to the other problematic idea that exists within study of the Greek and Roman world, this idea that they were particularly white in the way that we see whiteness now. Like, the, you know, there's, I've been trying to learning to put the phrase on it that we, you know, the way we see whiteness now yeah. impacts that versus them being white or not white. Yeah. Um, because obviously they did not see race in any of the same ways that we did. And like, they didn't really care about skill, skin color. It was all about whether or not you spoke Greek. That's yeah. what made you a good person or, or like worthy of, you know, <laughs> extreme, you know, uh, what's the word I want? Prejudice against you is, well, yeah. if you did, you speak Greek, you yeah. could be, you know, a person that we would call black, but if you spoke Greek, you're fine. Yeah. Um, because yeah, I mean, in the ancient world, they, they traded throughout the whole Mediterranean, which includes Africa and the Middle East, and they absolutely traveled around and emigrated and all of these different things where the idea of whiteness placed upon Greek or Greece and Rome is so absurd and, and nonsensical that, you know, you have to have this just this alternative view of all of it. You know, you have to believe yeah. Plato and you have to believe that everyone was white, even though it's simply marble has lost its color polychromy yeah. you know existed yeah. <laughs> and it all just came off and we all just see marble and then think of this whiteness it's yeah. it's so I mean I find it fascinating it's so dark too but it, yeah. it is just so interesting the way these things have yeah. become the mess that they are <laughs> yeah it's true and and the thing about conspiracy theory too and, and stigmatized knowledge um, which is a particular term coined by Michael Barkin who has written some wonderful wonderful work about conspiracy theories but people who believe in one conspiracy theory tend to believe in others. And mm -hmm. all of those come together to form a particular worldview that this person holds. So yeah, this idea of um, ancient Greeks being only white um, and tying that to Atlantis, you have to also believe like you were just explaining in other sort of conspiracy theories that help support each other to create this particular worldview. Mm -hmm. I mean, and all of these reasons are why I want to, to create these episodes on Atlantis because it's not about just like disproving Atlantis. That's not the point, right? Like if it was just about people believing in this like ancient world, that was kind of cool and that's all it was, then who yeah. cares? Like let them yeah. believe that, you know, but it's, it's all of the, the problems that stem from this belief and all of the racial yeah. issues and the straight, like dangerous racist ideologies that come yeah. out of this. And you're like, okay, well, I would like my listeners personally who are good hearted and not racist and not sexist and not misogynist and all of these different things. I would like them to understand that Atlantis is not real for all of these reasons. And I, it just interests me so much in the idea of how it became this because, yeah. you know, growing up, I think we're probably a similar age growing up. We had the Disney movie, you yeah, know, yeah. and I always just believed Atlantis was a myth. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily that I believed it was real, but I believed it was a Greek myth. Mm -hmm. And then getting to a point where I learned that it is not remotely a Greek myth, that alone was mind blowing to me. And I think most people think it's a myth, even if they don't have any strong views about it as history or conspiracy or whatever, but they at least think it was a myth because yeah. the world treats it like a myth. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And especially, I mean, it doesn't help that we have all of these these documentaries coming out on History mm. Channel or Discovery Channel or Travel Channel or whatever that are all about finding that evidence for Atlantis. Mm -hmm. um, there's this, this concept called discovery paranormalism, um, which comes from David Anderson and, and Jeb Card. They didn't come up with this term, but they've sort of begun applying it to pseudo-archaeology and, and discovery paranormalism sort of refers to being the first to find the proof of something. Mm. Um, th that is a very simplistic way of describing it, but that's part of the thrill. And so when you watch these shows, it's it's kind of like equal parts finding proof of Atlantis to prove these conspiracy theories true or prove your ideas right, but also just that thrill you get from finding, being the first to find this evidence. So... And that just, when you have um, folks who don't really know the history and they don't really know all this background context um, that, that we are all very privileged to have because we happen to be within these fields and these disciplines and we have access to these resources, 
it's kind of easy to to fall for it. Um, I I don't blame anybody for falling for pseudoarchaeology, any pseudoarchaeological theory. I'll never be mad at anybody who falls into that. It's really easy to see why, like, those are the books you get on the bookshelves. Those, those are the shows you get on Netflix and Prime and TV channels and whatnot. Um, so we just need to, I, I'm a big advocate of giving folks the tools that I use to deconstruct these and, and assess these um, and hoping that it sort of makes people a bit more aware. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing to talk about Atlantis. I don't think it's a bad thing to have books and shows and movies that use Atlantis as a plot line, but you do have to acknowledge that side of the Atlantis story, this dark mm -hmm. side, how Atlantis has been used to cause some really serious harm to people. And I'm talking like physical harm to people. If you're going to use Atlantis as a plot line, acknowledge that shit talk about it make people aware make yourself aware and don't repeat that um, yeah those are my concerns yeah i think that's so valid i mean yeah and to be clear like i think that disney movie is great like it's so fun i loved it's, it it's wonderful it's an yeah. incredibly entertaining movie it's yeah. more entertaining even when you understand how little there actually is like yeah. you know it, it, like how little history how little you know you, there's that the whole sort of beginning scene where he's laying out his whole argument and you think oh my god look at all of this so much evidence and he's like yeah. no <laughs> literally <laughs> yeah. no yeah um yeah so that's the thing right it's well and that's why you know to any of my listeners who didn't know that atlantis wasn't a myth or who didn't know all the, these problematic things and just assumed atlantis was like this cool idea or this cool lost city or all of these different things yeah like no blame. Like I used to think it was a myth until probably until this podcast where I, you know, just read up enough. Like, I don't even think in my degree, there was any reason for anyone to just come out and say Atlantis was never a myth, right? It just yeah. doesn't necessarily come up. Whereas it does come up in pop culture to teach you that it yeah. is a myth. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's more about just pointing out that, you know, it's, it wasn't a myth. It was not history, you know, all these different things. And, but also specifically the harm that has been caused in its name. And that's why you have to like be a little careful about the idea of it and, and yeah. you know, what you believe and why and where you've gotten it from and, you know, yeah. who had these ideas also. And yeah, I mean, yeah. the fact that the Nazis were looking for Atlantis, I think is, is a good thing to know. <laughs> I think it makes yeah. a connection there between, yeah. you know, perhaps, you know, what, what can become a problem with believing or not necessarily mm -hmm. believing, but, you know, just the side, the, the different aspects of it and, and where it has gone mm -hmm. over time. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And especially I like your point about knowing where that information came from. If you're going to use something, know where it came from. Um, I think about like a, a comic series that I, I read that I really enjoyed, but um, was based on Atlantis and kind of in the back of each ep um, issue. I'm, did Dave Anderson talked to you about pop culture. I'm assuming he talked about pop culture. He's a pop culture kind of guy. To an extent. We talked about the, move, the Atlantis movie and like a couple other things, but I don't think about Okay. This. So yeah, I'm not sure if he would have talked about this series or not, but um, it's, it's a great series. I really enjoyed it. But at the back of each issue, there were like... Um, I guess supposed to be like diary entries from mm. the character that the other characters were looking for in the mm. series. He had disappeared while searching for Atlantis. And um, so they find his diary. And I guess each of these issues is sort of a diary entry. Um, and it's clear that these comic creators did a lot of research in by like the information that's in these diary issues um, or diary entries. You could go on Google and you can find a lot of this information, these theories that people believed or these like illustrations of maps that actually exist, stuff like that, um, which is, is great. Like I like detail and accuracy, but also in this case, like where did that information come from that you are now putting into your comic and broadcasting out to your, your audience. And I see, I've seen some of the things in those diary entries picked up by uh, some QAnon believers who talked about kind of the same things and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So that's why I think it's, it's so important to know where that information came from, acknowledge that, own that too. Like I know other um, pseudo archeologists and, and conspiracy theorists I've seen one in, in particular, I'm thinking of a video or um, one of his books where he was writing about um, something to do with Mars, if I remember correctly, in this particular section. And he's quoting this one person quite often, information from this one person. And it's basically like, yeah, this guy was a Nazi, but that doesn't really matter. It actually does matter. Um, 
So yeah, be aware of where that information is coming from. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it should always matter if a person was a Nazi. There's a lot of groups where it maybe matters less. I think it always matters if somebody was a Nazi. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I've been, I've been told, um, when talking about this, the Nazis in Atlantis, I, I have been told by this individual who I mentioned earlier who likes to email me and talk mm. on Twitter that, you know, it's time to let's let's move past the Nazis. Stop talking about the Nazis. It's time to kind of move on. We've heard enough about the Nazis. I'm like, mm, I don't think we have. No, I no. don't think we are as a humanity are ever allowed to move on. Th- yep. That should be the point. We're not allowed. You're not allowed yep. to ever say like we've moved past the Nazis. Nope. Nope. <laughs> that's, nope. That's why they say history repeats itself. Like, right? You know. <laughs> history is repeating itself right now. So be oh, aware yeah. of that. More so, so than ever. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Oh, man. Atlantis. Always an interesting conversation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, um, I mean, what else? Like, this is just fascinating and it's fun. And I, uh, yeah, it's nice talking to a woman about this as well, because I think you get it. You have a different side of it. Yes. It's yeah. also damn fascinating so if you <laughs> it is it is it's just yeah it's um it's one of those things that i think archaeologists are really really opening up to i think mm. you know we we knew it was there um but to what degree we weren't entirely aware and i um i spend time going into really terrible places on the internet and just to see what people are saying and uh it is shocking, even to me, like I expected to find archaeology, I expected to find pseudo archaeology. Um, but even then, I'm still surprised at how much is in there. Mm. Um, but I, yeah, I think it just sort of all comes down to this idea of just trying to find this tangible proof of something and, and it's certain certain theory, uh, theories, more so than others, like Salutrian is very, very popular. Um, Atlantis. What is and that? Arian, the Salutrian hypothesis. Um, so Salutrian hypothesis is this idea that was proposed. Um, it was proposed, I think, originally in the 30s, and then it kind of died away because even back then archaeologists were like, "This no, this isn't very credible theory. And then it was revived in the 90s. Is the idea that about 20-ish thousand, but somewhere, I think it's somewhere between 17 and 20,000 years ago, um, the Salutrian folks, which were a, a a culture uh, within southwestern Europe, France and Spain, Portugal, uh, Portugal, France and Spain. In any case, they're known for their like beautiful artwork. Um, also, they have these very particular stone um, lithic points called Salutrian points for the and it's the way they're crafted and whatnot. They're known for these. So the Salutrian hypothesis suggested that sometime 20, fifteen to twenty thousand years ago, Salutrian people came across the Atlantic, which was frozen. So they partially climbed across, um, almost like portaging across this frozen mm. bridge, also with boats, um, and they came into to North America, what is now North America. Um, and it's entirely based on a couple of fluted lithic points that were found um, that resemble Salutrian. They really do look like Salutrian points, but like that people can sort of come up with the same thing and independently. Um, so anyway, yeah, it was this idea. Also, like, there's no evidence for Salutrians having watercraft at all. So where did this idea of them taking boats come across? And and especially mm-hmm. thinking about how they were known for their artwork. They have this just beautiful, beautiful artwork. Nowhere do boats appear in that artwork. So mm. um, there are sort of many. It's it's not a, bit, a lot of archaeologists disagree with this theory. They don't find it very credible. Um, they've discredited it for decades now. The uh, Salutrian hypothesis has become very, very popular within white national circles um, because of this idea of Europeans first. Um, even though recent genetic evidence suggests that uh, Salutrian folks or, or people who were living around that, that time period, 22-ish thousand years ago, uh, likely had darker skin. Yeah, especially in that area. Yeah, exactly. That does yeah. not matter. So. No. Uh, yeah, within white nationalist circles, the, the Salutrian has been very, very adopted. Um, it appears on particular white nationalist websites within this sort of manifesto on one white nationalist website. It's like the first thing that's discussed. Hmm. And yeah, they these nationalists sort of use it to say, you know, white Europeans were here first. And then First Nations people came and violently displaced us. And we were, <laughs> oh, oh my God. <laughs> it feeds into this, this conspiracy <sighs> theory called uh, the Great Replacement Theory. Um, oh, yeah. Yes. And, and this is 
viewed as, as proof, physical proof of that, even though there is no evidence for any sort of violent displacement of, of white Europeans at any point. No. But yeah, that is a very popular, wow. popular theory. Um, it also, like I was saying, it's been widely discredited by archaeologists, but a few years ago, the CBC um, on the nature of things had uh, a documentary dedicated to the solution hypothesis and the what if it is real type of thing. Oh, gosh. And that was a whole thing. Um, the director archaeologists immediately were like, whoa, 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 hang on. Uh, this isn't particularly great. Um, part of the issue was in the early 2000s on Discovery Channel, there was uh, a documentary about Salutrian hypothesis that used only white actors. And that also sort of is what fed into this idea of, um, or why white nationalists adopted, is they, they cite that documentary quite often too. So there was concern about that essentially being repeated through the CBC. Um, questions about, are you going to address the white nationalists appropriations of this theory and CBC was like, or the director, I should say, was like, no, like, I, I don't want to give any lick of air to that discussion at all, because their idea was by not talking about it, you're not amplifying it or, or not supporting it. Mm -hmm. But you're also yeah. not saying no to that. Yeah. And you're not pointing out the problematic nature of the theory in general. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that was, uh, there was an interview for um, one of the big newspapers about that. And that's where this director was saying that. But then also one of the archaeologists also said that uh, that that racist appropriation side was not his issue. And he can't control how people are going to use the theory. And I, that line. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah, white middle-aged man. Um, oh, well. And right. he had the call Shocker. to say that? Weird. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And that line, like, I think about that line all the time. It just drove me bananas because uh, mm -hmm. I think it is your issue. Like, yes, you can't control how people are going to, to appropriate your work. But I, I do think you have a responsibility to speak out against that. Mm -hmm. Also, keeping in mind, like, what we were talking about earlier about how certain um, folks do have to be more concerned about their safety than other folks if they're going to confront this. But... We do, we do have to confront it, and it is our issue. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think about that. And one of the one of the neo-Nazi uh, groups I mentioned also ties Atlantis to Salutrians. Mm. So they sort of all run in the same circles. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think as Canadian too, we have a, a. I don't. I mean, I don't think it's bigger than those in the states, but I certainly think you know, given our world at this current moment, like white Canadians have a real responsibility to not perpetuate problematic theories that affect you know indigenous people that we have already yeah like completely ruined over generations yeah. the idea of of then adding something on top of that 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 like suggests mm -hmm. that they were not you know here first and that we you know yeah. any of it yeah. like it's yeah, such an exactly. important issue in Canada specifically. Yeah, it is. So. It really is. It's the, that mm -hmm. history. We, we can't deny, don't deny that history, except that mm -hmm. this happened. Uh, and it's really, it's not history. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't deny it. Don't rewrite it. Don't try to like alter it to make yourself feel better as a, a white settler Canadian, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gosh, absolutely. Oh my gosh. I guess this is just something that's occurred to me, but um are there archaeologists working on residential schools then? Is that like a thing happening in Canada? Yeah. Um, so archaeologists, it's it's not archaeology. That work is yeah. very clearly not archaeology. Um, archaeologists just have, uh, some archaeologists do, not all, um, but some have a very particular skill set in using GPR equipment um, to be mm. able to uh, analyze the data in particular ways to um, determine if there are graves or not. Um, mm. And it, it's a very particular skill set, and it's a very small number of archaeologists who have that skill set. Um, one of my my PhD colleagues, he's also doing his PhD. Uh, he and my supervisor, who's also um, my supervisor student, they are some of them, uh, some of those very small group of, of archaeologists who have those skills. And um, the group that I'm part of has sort of my supervisor in particular has really taken the lead on starting those conversations, drawing together these archaeologists. We've been putting together resources to give to communities because not um, there are so few of us that we can't possibly expect to go and do the physical work ourselves. But we also want to make sure that if communities are going to hire 
um, like geophysics companies, they know the right questions to ask to help them feel more assured that they're going to get the right information or get as much information as they can. So, hmm. um, yes, we've been very, very involved in that. Um, That's great. Yeah, and we've wow. been we've been working with several communities. We've gone and done uh, a few surveys. That's where I was the other week. I was on one of the surveys, and uh, so yeah, we, there are a lot of a, a fair number of archaeologists now who are working with communities for that work specifically. That's great. I didn't know that. That's yeah. I mean, that's yeah. so important, and yeah, the government should be doing it. But hey, they're not. Yeah, <laughs> um. <laughs> they definitely should be funding it, and and they're yeah, they are right. to some degree, but it's. The funding not they've announced is not enough. No, no, not enough. No. Oh Lord. Yeah. Anyway, Canada. I so rarely <laughs> talk to Canadians, as you can tell. I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah. things that other people understand. That it's so. It's I'm usually like explaining half the things to anybody. Right. <laughs> so nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, this it turns out when I get along with people, that means for a really disjointed but really entertaining <laughs> conversation. So yeah. thank you so much. I just want to kind of wrap things up for however I cut this together, yeah. but. Thank you, Steph, so much for doing this. It's so fascinating and interesting. And I mean, obviously, it's so dark. I, I have so much trouble with I sound so excited talking about how interesting, but it just, I mean, that the way all of these things happen and how they get to these horrifying points interests me so much. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. just, my God, I mean, it must interest you too, because you're doing your PhD in it. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And we should be interested in it because yeah. that, it's through that interest that we become more aware, right? So That's so true. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Um, well, do you want to um, share where people can maybe learn more about your research or follow you or anything? If you don't want to, that's also fine. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a hard person to find. You can find me on Twitter. Um, are you gonna Are you gonna include like links on your like website? I can. Or? Yeah. Okay. Can, whatever. You yeah. Want. Yeah. That's yeah. totally fine. Yeah. You can find me. Twitter is where I'm most active. I'm all over Twitter, um, and that is definitely the best place to find me. Wonderful. I think it's such really interesting and obviously important work that you're doing researching this kind of stuff. And I didn't even, I guess it didn't even occur to me that, I mean, certainly archaeology in it is so interesting. And now, of course, the more we hear about Atlantis, like the more I think it's obviously important, but I'm glad to hear people are doing it. (laughs) If not (laughs) always specifically Atlantis, but you know, it's all so interconnected that uh, it is. It is. Sometimes Atlantis pops up in surprising places. I bet. Yeah. The yep. more I hear, the more that does not surprise me. It has gone yep. everywhere. Yep. It's always Atlantis. It's always Blavatsky. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much. This has been so great. Thank you very much. Oh, nerds, nerds, nerds. This Atlantis series has been so incredibly fun, and I certainly hope you felt the same way. It was definitely a departure from my regularly scheduled programming, covering the story that is so explicitly not a myth, but also is something in itself somewhat bizarre and interesting, and then to look at what it's become, the links to outright racism, straight up Nazism, among so much more, it blew my mind every step of the way. I want to give a huge thank you to my archaeologist to my archaeologist guests, Flint Dibble, David S. Anderson, and Steph Holmhofer. Their expertise added so, so much to this series, and I'm just so thrilled I was able to share their knowledge with all of you to help it influence my research, the whole thing. Also to my other guests, one of whom you haven't even heard from yet, Kira Jones and Lisa Charlotte, who joined me to talk about Atlantis in pop culture and what that means for the story that isn't a myth. Truly, truly, this has been so much fun. It's been so rewarding. I'm so thrilled I got to bring all of this to you, to teach you all of this, to learn it myself. Fucking Atlantis. Like, who fucking knew? God. (sighs) Thank you all so much for listening. Back to some mythology very soon. (laughs) Some regular old... Just lovely oral tradition mythology of ancient Greece. What a time. (laughs) Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you to my guests. Thank you to anyone who cares about learning the truth about Atlantis so that you don't fall into some dark and dangerous conspiracy hole that you don't even know is there. (sighs) I am Liv, and I love this shit being learning, not the conspiracies of Atlantis. (laughs) 